So I've just put into the uh, chat again, for those who perhaps joined us after I posted it before, just a link to uh, some notes. So I'm screen sharing it here. So if you click on the link, it should take you to this um, WordPress site, uh, which is hosted on EGBlogs. So this is um, pretty much free WordPress hosting. Um, it's run by the same company that hosts the uh, Uni Melbourne uh, WordPress uh, install as well. So uh, if you're interested in exploring hosting on WordPress, then you might want to check out EduBlogs. Anyway, so I'm using it as a bit of a base camp, I suppose, for these boot camps. Um, so you can see up the top, um, I've got a series of about six different boot camps throughout the year. This is the first one, the Mercer Reality one. And uh, I thought I'd use this as a bit of a home base. Um, so there's a link to there to the uh, enrollment pages that Dean has put up. And uh, only one post so far, which is just a welcome and an overview. Um, but if we have a look at the immersive reality page there, this is pretty much the notes for the, uh, the week. And um, what I've tried to do really is to have a bit of a, I suppose, overview of different elements of uh, immersive reality, which is on a spectrum from, you know, I guess, real reality, you know, interacting face to face right through to virtually where you're completely distant. So augmented reality fits on that continuum and uh, other types of immersive reality as well. Perhaps wearable technologies, etc. Um, and really just try to make it sort of no, so it's not a huge, you know, hours and hours of Zoom to break this up over effectively five elements. So the first element is a pre-reading guide, which uh, you would have all been sent the link, but uh, I'm not, not going to assume that you have read it. So uh, that's pretty much the topic of today's webinar is, is going over that, that pre-reading and what's the, uh, um, the point of some of those um, elements that I've, that I've sent out to you. So that's today's webinar, which is just one hour. Uh, then tomorrow, another one hour, but it'll be an expert panel and that will include several of the people that are here. So Stuart, Mitch, Meredith, and uh, a few other people that I've invited across the university and beyond to give us some of their experiences. Um, some people that are very experienced in, in using immersive reality in different domains, different contexts, which is fantastic. And um, hopefully we'll have a, a, a good Q&A and a bit of discussion with those, those experts tomorrow. So today's session and tomorrow's um, I'm recording and we'll make available for people who can't make it to these sessions. Then the following two days, a two hours uh, intro to a bit of a hands-on uh, workshop. We're going to have a look at three different technologies in each, each workshop. And uh, then hopefully have enough time for you to have a bit of an exploration, a bit of a play, a bit of a sign up, try them out and uh, see if some of these tools are useful for your own context and how you might be able to start thinking about applying them and, and sharing some of those ideas with, with uh, this wider body of people. So that's kind of where we're heading over the four days. And um, the first part was the, the uh, short guide, um, but I'm gonna pretty much go over that today. So today's session um, really is introducing, I guess the the rest of the week, some of the tools that we're using and um, just sort of getting started with some of the concepts. So feel free to jump in at any time, ask questions, um, anything that you want to share from your own experiences, that would be fantastic. So uh, otherwise it'll be pretty boring listening to me for the next 45 minutes. So be keen for you to be as interactive as, as possible. So one way I've tried to do that, as you can see, there's a, I, I sent a link to you all, an invite to the WordPress P2. If you haven't come across P2 before, it's WordPress's kind of version of, um, I suppose, a replacement for Google uh, Plus communities. Uh, it's kind of like the discussion forum. And uh, so this is the, the P2 site. I'll just quickly refresh it to see if anyone else has joined so far. So I did send you all a link. Um, if you're wondering what it was, this is what it is. It's just a discussion forum where people can actually ask uh, questions, post comments, etc., share anything over the next week. And uh, this will be 
a discussion forum that will run right across all the six of the boot camps. So you can quickly see who signed up. So um, if you have a look at the, uh, the actual profiles here, it uses uh, Gravatar. So this is Gravatar. It's, it's pretty much a, an online profile that WordPress uses across all the WordPress type of sites. So when you set up your Gravatar profile, if you haven't before, uh, it becomes like a, an online profile that uh, WordPress will, will bring across all of, its, all of its sites and allows you to have a bit of a link to um, your other sites, other work, et cetera, give yourself a bit of a profile. Um, so I see that uh, I think Solange has done a little bit on her profile. Here's Solange, there we are. So I'm just using Solange as a guinea pig here. So Solange has um, you know, got, got where she's from, no links yet, but uh, uh, at least there's a little bit of an intro to Solange. Be great to have a photo as well, Solange, so we can actually see that it's actually you and not a robot. Yep, that would be cool. Um, so yeah, it just encouraged people to, to share and um, you know, be willing to uh, paste photos and, and discussion comments and stuff here. So that's the P2 discussion. The other link that I sent you, which uh, hopefully has come through to email, though you might want to perhaps check your spam filter uh, or possibly, you know, uh, might have gone through to trash even. Um, I'll just, these links are all in the, the uh, main WordPress site, but there's the link to the discussion forum. Um, if you can't find the email inviting you, then just flick me an email and, uh, and I'll put my email address in the chat and I'll resend the invite. So there's my email address. The other link that I sent was to a Mendeley group. Uh, Mendeley is kind of like EndNote or Zotero. It's an online referencing platform. Um, it was a bit more like ResearchGate as well. It's a bit like a research network. Uh, but they, um, for some reason, they're deciding to scale the, the network side of it back, which includes the, the public groups. So they used to have public groups, but now they only allow private groups. Um, but University of Melbourne subscribes, has an institutional subscription to Mendeley. So you can download the software for free and you can create private groups and share um, references, etc. And so what I've done here, once again, I'll just refresh it to see if, Anyone else has joined? So we've got Stuart, Angelina, Slonge, and Neela so far. Um, you can see you can send out invites via email addresses. So um, although this is a private group, I've just sent out those invites to everyone who's enrolled. Um, and what it basically is is, is a collection of references relevant to uh, immersive reality in various domains. And hopefully this will be a useful resource for you. Um, and once you're invited, you should be able to upload uh, your own ideas to this as well and add to it. So if you have set up your Mendeley account, um, the best way to view these is if you, you once you've logged in, and you can see I've logged in because my name's at the top. If you click on view group documents and library, it op actually opens up in my Mendeley online library. And um, what I've done is created a few folders. So I've got the TEL TEL boot camps, uh, and then divided those up into folders, just so it's easier to categorise um, these references. So if you want to focus on the immersive reality ones, then you can click on that folder and find all the references relevant to immersive reality for my dual delivery workshop next week. Um, they're in a separate folder. But on the basic web interface, they're just all, all together as a list. So by opening it up in your Mendeley account, effectively, it should give you these in folders. Um, I'm hoping it does. Has anyone uh, opened that up and is it working in, in giving you folders or not? Getting lots of blank looks there. 
Anyway, that might be a bit of homework, is um, set up your Mendeley account if you haven't already. And uh, that would make it slightly easier for you. So anyway, jumping back to our notes for today. Um, first thing I want to do is have a little bit of a survey, find out what you know. So you've given us all a little bit of an intro, so most people got some experience, but I've got a little survey here on Qualtrics. So I'll put the link into the chat in case you're not on this page. Um, <clears throat> but if you click on that uh, Qualtrics link, I guess the questions, um, it should only take two or three minutes to actually do the survey. It's, it's, it's pretty quick. Most of the questions are multi-answer, so you can choose more than one. So while you're doing that, we'll go back to my wonderful playlist and listen to Bruce Coburn again. Oh, you're not hearing the music, Stuart. You're missing out. Is anyone I'm else not, not hearing the music? I'm not hearing it, Tom, no. Oh, sad. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I did tick the, uh, you know, share box at the yeah, start, yeah, yeah. but uh, okay. Well, that's a bummer then. I've had that exact same problem. That's why I just thought I'd mention it. I thought I was entertaining my students with some great, great sounds. And then I found out that it, actually for about two or three minutes, uh, they were hearing absolutely nothing. So, yeah. Okay, the vagaries of Zoom, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm sure I've had it working in the past, but anyway. I might as well stop it then because I'm the only one enjoying it. So how many people use Qualtrics for surveys? Looks like most people, yep. All right. Maybe you wanna uh, give me a hands up or something when you've completed the survey. One of the things I, I don't particularly like about Qualtrics is the mobile app is really clunky. <laughs> so it's actually hard for me to get feedback to see who's actually uh, finished the survey. I probably gave you too many choices to tick. Stuart's probably ticking them all. It's taking a while just reading through all of them. <laughs> I'm hoping it serves as, as a bit of a, a uh, interest as well. So maybe there's things you haven't heard of, which uh, you might think, oh, hmm. perhaps I could look into that. Yeah, that last oh, question is a doozy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're writing an essay, are you, Mitch? Well, you, you know, you should have put constructivism next to constructionism next to connectivism, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Just to throw us off the off the trail. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have I have put an incredibly brief um, uh, summary of what they are. Um, so it's just uh, a one-liner. So that that is a good point, though, Mitch. Because what what I'm really hoping over this week is is uh, perhaps going beyond just playing with technology to really trying to connect to pedagogy and and uh, learning theory and and um, you know have a real strong foundation for why you would get into using immersive reality and teaching and learning, not to, not just because uh, you think it's cool, but um, because it actually can achieve um, you know certain learning outcomes and perhaps uh, facilitate certain learning um, theoretical approaches as well. I wonder if I stop sharing and try starting sharing again, if the audio will work. I'll try that. Share sound. Does that work? Okay. Random. At least now you get to hear my wonderful playlist. Who's managed to finish the survey? One, it's launch. You get a chocolate fish. <laughs> My star student, it's along. There we go. So how long do I have to wait for this chocolate fish talk? <laughs> oh, at least two and a half months. Oh, I should have also said there's a QR code uh, there if you want to scan it on your mobile device to take the survey. And you can you can multitask as well. Anyway, while people are finishing, I'll um, just stop my wonderful music there. Um, also want to point out that um, I thought we could use a hashtag, a Twitter hashtag for the uh, bootcamp series. So I've come up with this fantastic hashtag. It's uh, very creative, hash XR Bootcamp. Um, and if we actually have a look at it, the hashtag and do a search for it, you'll see people actually are using it already. So uh, that's the nature of hashtags is that uh, um, you can't, um, you know, reserve them and own, uh, for, for your own use. Anyone can use a hashtag. So it's usually a good thing to do a bit of a search for a hashtag before use it to make sure no one's using it for nasty things. But in this case, apparently there are a whole lot of XR boot camps that have been happening around the world. Um, and so we could actually learn from them by you. If you want to search for that XR boot camp uh, hashtag on Twitter, you will find there's, there's quite a bit of activity around immersive reality that people have been sharing via that hashtag. So even though it's already in use, I thought it was probably a useful thing because you might find some useful resources beyond what I'm sharing from some of the other boot camps that have happened. Yeah, there are some really expensive ones um, from a company out of the Netherlands, I think, that you saw in that, in that stream there. Right. They're all sort of, you know, really technical masterclasses though, based on programming hand gestures and things like that. Yeah, they look pretty heavily technical, so. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so Solange says she's got the Mendeley library open, but none of the folders. So it's just a list, is it? Solange. Oh, okay. Maybe it's only doing the list in my library, but anyway. It did used to work, but they have, as I said, uh, decided to change some of the features of Mendeley end of last year. Mm. Um, what I might do in that case is um, perhaps do a, uh, a tag or something on the, the papers so we can search for our tag. Anyway, that'll be my homework. Right, okay. So um, that's some of the intro stuff. I wanted to look at the overview. Um, so the overview, and if you haven't finished the, the survey, feel free to do that um, while, while I'm sort of carrying on. I wanted to look at some design principles for immersive reality, and that's pretty much the pre-reading guide. Um, you'll see it, if you click on the link, it opens up in an Evernote. So if you actually have Evernote on your computer or on your mobile device, um, you can pull it into your Evernotes. Um, if you don't, then it works fine just on any web browser. Um, so I'm just going to go into um, my Evernote because I'll put it into presentation mode. So uh, interesting tip, um, I've used Evernote for quite a number of years and uh, the last update to Evernote end of last year, they decided to remove the presentation mode as a feature. So uh, they updated the app and uh, remove some of the best features from it. So I've, I've um, gone back um, to a previous version of Evernote so I can have my most favorite feature, which is the presentation mode. Anyway, just by the by. Um, once again, there's a QR code if you want to view this on your mobile device um, or a short link underneath it. This is using the uh, University of Melbourne short link creator. So it's quite a nice short one go.unimelb.edu.au and if you want to create your own you can go there you have to log in with your network login uh, and create short links and it saves them to a database there so really um, there's a whole wave of immersive reality uh, technologies um, I think probably uh, augmented reality and virtual reality are the most popular and probably the most well known Augmented reality certainly got a huge boost um, in public understanding or knowledge through Pokemon Go. So a couple of years back, um, you know, possibly a lot of people who weren't so techie didn't really understand what augmented reality was, but certainly with Pokemon Go, it was incredibly popular and people started getting. So that's what it is. Uh, and virtual reality, what's well, been around for a long time, quite a number of years, but it's been pretty pretty much sort of for a niche market, been quite expensive to get into. Um, and uh, if you haven't been able to afford the very expensive uh, head mounted displays, um, you, your only view into that has been on a desktop and uh, mousing around or lately on something like a tablet and, and uh, using the, the touch interface to get into it. But over the last few years, since about 2014, when Google brought out Google Cardboard, suddenly the, uh, the introduction, uh, as far as cost goes, and the, the ability for users to be able to create uh, virtual reality content, uh, the barrier really dropped quite significantly. And uh, Google Cardboard, uh, you, know, you can buy you know, four or five dollars, or some companies even gave away um, millions of Google Cardboards, um, the New York Times, um, had an issue where it gave away something like 3 million copies of Google Cardboard for free with the paper. Uh, and, um, you know, two or three years ago, the, the, the hype was that, uh, particularly from um, Facebook, um, was that everyone will be wearing virtual reality uh, goggles pretty much all day long. And so there's these photos of people wearing them on trams and buses and, and stuff. And, uh, Certainly Facebook wants us to get into the Oculus because um, they see it as a big market. But at the end of the day, it's, it's still really be, um, stayed a bit of a niche market. Um, there was the Samsung Gear um, as well, a slight step up from the Google Cardboard. And, uh, but the support for that's been dropped recently as well as Google Cardboard. Um, and it's really been pushing towards sort of the mid-level mid type of experience around the Oculus Quest type of level a few hundred dollars for a standalone headset 
um, and uh, getting away a bit from the having to have a high-end headset tethered to a very powerful laptop to be able to do some of this stuff. So certainly it's a lot more affordable to get into. And if you're looking at the uh, Google Cardboard or bottom end type of uh, approach, that's certainly accessible for students. Um, you're a little bit on your own now, unfortunately, as far as support for that goes, because as I say, Google's pretty much like they, they tend to do, um, create a platform, support it for a few years, and then pull the plug and move on to something else they find more interesting, or perhaps they can make more money out of. Um, but Google Cardboard uh, compatible platforms and uh, web-based um, delivery platforms uh, are still available. Uh, <clears throat> so just want to give you a bit of an overview and introduction to a few of these. Uh, we've done a fair bit of research around this and applying them. One of the key things that uh, we tried to really approach it is using a design-based research methodology. So trying to underpin it with a with a solid foundation of research. And I think a design-based research approach allows us to, to have quite a solid approach. Um, if you haven't used design-based research, it's kind of similar to design thinking. It's, it's a bit wider than that, but effectively it's a four-stage approach. You start by analyzing the, uh, what's the problem <clears throat> uh, in, this, in, in, in teaching and learning. It's what, what is the pedagogical problem? What are you trying to achieve? What are the learning outcomes? What are the learning goals you're trying to um, perhaps uh, meet that are a bit more authentic than you can do in other types of technologies? Moves on to then to the second stage, which is prototyping a, an approach to doing that, um, developing something very quickly, um, putting it into practice, practice, getting some user feedback, and then having an iterative loop of design, redesign based on evaluation, and then moving on to uh, beyond that to creating design principles that are transferable. So there's certain environments that really map really easily or, or quite authentically to immersive reality. Uh, these tend to be things like uh, clinical health, where there's a lot of simulation involved in, in those learning experiences anyway. It tends to be perhaps mannequin based or um, model based or 3D model based. Uh, automation, um, big uptake in automation around augmented reality. So basically having like an overlay of virtual manual instead of having to flick through a, a printed text to, to work on an engine or automotive task uh, with a head mounted display or a, a mobile device with a camera, um, something like, a, or a HoloLens type of approach. Um, it's just in your face and uh, objects are mapped via their uh, object recognition. Um, high risk environments, um, environments where people need to learn, but you don't want to kill them. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of my PhD students is, is exploring um, mountain climbing. Um, <clears throat> he's a very experienced mountain climber and has found that basically the people that tend to kill themselves are the experienced mountain climbers because they push themselves too far. It's not the, uh, the novice people, it's the people who've been doing it for many years and, and finally managed to save up enough money to, to, uh, to get to Everest. And because it's cost them $30,000, they're not going to stop even if the weather packs up and they ignore all the cues that they have learnt and end up getting frostbite or uh, altitude sickness and killing themselves. So how can we um, <clears throat> you know, involve learners in really high risk environments without uh, you know, um, high risk? So immersive reality is one way to do that. Um, environments that are too costly to produce um, or just un, you, know, you can't physically get there and that, that's some of the stuff that Stuart's been involved in. Uh, you know, how do you do virtual field trips in time of uh, isolation and COVID and, and uh, how do you make those field trips available at, at a, at a uh, reasonable cost or for free for your students? So pretty much any educational environment that, that uses simulation can map to uh, immersive reality, whether that be augmented or virtual reality. Um, so I've kind of based some of these notes around uh, a few recent articles and a few recent um, conferences that have been around. Um, so I've linked to those. There's, there's an ACODE, a couple of ACODE workshops that Tully 2018. Um, 
uh, conference, which has had a stream on immersive reality. Uh, and it's become quite popular and particularly in educational technology based conferences, immersive reality has become very popular as a topic. So what are some of the key themes and perhaps design principles so we don't have to reinvent the wheel? When we're looking at um, why would we go and design these and how would we do it? So I guess that's probably one of the key takeaways I wanna try to um, get across today is, is what are some of the design principles so we're not just um, you know, going at it without too many clues or just playing with technology tools. So one of the things that I uh, really found, and I was involved in a systematic review in clinical health around um, immersive reality and particularly mobile uh, mixed reality in healthcare education. And from um, over almost 1500 um, studies, uh, we found only 18 that really were relevant uh, to mobile in, in particular, but also uh, that had any reference to learning theory. So I guess in a way I found it a bit shocking that uh, a lot of people are engaging in using immersive reality in teaching and learning, but they're not engaging in learning theory and build, bridging that gap. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, I tried this, student thought it was cool, they were engaged. And, um, but yeah why <laughs> and uh, I, i've seen some really really bad examples of of doing this um <clears throat> and and um context where it's kind of like well why why did you do that and you've, all you've done is made your students life harder um you know perhaps some immersive reality for learning maths concepts when it would be easier just to give students an actual uh, a model and explore that um, so, you know, for example, uh, trying to understand the concept of uh, the volume of a cone compared to the volume of a cylinder uh, in immersive reality uh, and the fact that the volume of a cone is the third the volume of, of uh, the same height sphere, uh, a cylinder. Um, it just made more sense to me to give students a cylinder and a cone and fill it up with water and just have an experiment. Why do it in virtual reality, which just seemed to be a whole lot harder and a whole lot of uh, design work to do something that could be done extremely easily with objects you can find in your kitchen. Um, so I guess it's just trying to sort of say, well, why are you doing this? Um, is it appropriate? Are you making the learning more authentic? Is it something that's actually hard to do or simulation based? Um, if, if not, then, then perhaps, perhaps you're, you're looking at the wrong technology. So, you know, start with why. <laughs> and is it appropriate? Is it the right technology? Thomas, can I add a point there? Yeah, sure, Mitch. I came across one that was um, uh, sponsored by Lego, I think, and um, it was a sort of a, an offshoot of Lego Mindstorms, I think they were yes. called. Yeah, yeah. And it was about um, you know building robots and programming them to move and do things. And I think that's a, an example where um, you know you you're kind of um, you actually do want to get your hands on the real things and make real things that are made out of plastic and rubber and metal and stuff. But the idea of having this sort of infinite toolkit is an, exactly um, an example where it makes sense. Um, you know, you, it, was it was hard to get in there and kind of go through all the tutorials. You had to labour through it all. Mm -hmm. And it would have been much easier just typing onto a screen and doing it. But the, the um, experience of watching the robot move next to you after you programmed it and then watching it come closer and further away really did make a difference i think yeah and yep. and i would i would imagine the cost of it is was driven way way down too because you can have an infinite toolkit yep as opposed yeah. to buying all those components storms for my grandson but they were like six seven hundred dollars you know so um a bit bit too expensive for a christmas present um but there are other, other alternatives as well so you know he's really into lego and uh, i came across um edison um 
probably slightly off topic, but I think that robotics is, is, is another form of, you know, immersive technology in a way. Um, and the Edison <clears throat> uh, robots are more around the $100, $150 and they're Lego compatible. So he can build his Lego on top of them uh, rather than, you know, spending almost $1,000 for a Lego Mindstorm. And uh, it's also scaffolded. So you can start with, you know, just scanning a, effectively a barcode because it has a has a little um, uh, light um, reader that you can just get it to drive over a barcode and it programs it right through to uh, using um, object drawing to programming on, on a tablet or iPad right through to code. But yeah, it's kind of, what are you trying to achieve and is this, this the right technology to get there? So some of the key things for me is, is um, uh, embedding this into the right sort of pedagogy. And for me, I, I guess anything that I'm, that I'm looking at with curriculum design, I really want to focus on the scholarship of technology enhanced learning. In other words, inform it by a scholarly approach. So that's why uh, this term, the scholarship of technology enhanced learning, you might've come across subtle, the scholarship of teaching and learning. So it's the same sort of concept, except that applying it to technology um, because unfortunately in the technology world, people seem to just get enamored with the technology and, and forget um, you know, all the scholarship behind it. Um, the other key for me is, is what am I trying to achieve as far as learning outcomes and the types of capabilities that I want my students to have. And for me, a key capability is this concept of hortagogy, which you might not have come across. Uh, but hortagogy is, is student-directed or student-determined learning. In other words, I want to give my students the ability to be learners and be self-directed learners, not to just follow a, a, a whole lot of steps. So for me, it's moving away from what can I do with a competence approach to a capability approach and build creativity. And so it's, it's kind of like, well, if I'm going to design a, an immersive reality experience, it's got to be more than just um, a linear progression or effectively a... Um, a virtual version of a textbook. Because uh, for me, that's not what I'm trying to achieve as a learning goal. Is that kind of making sense? So you sort of look at what are you trying to achieve? What's your pedagogical goal? And is your approach, is your technology and how you're using it mapping to that? Or are you just creating a, a virtual ebook in another format? Um, is that what you're wanting to achieve or not? Um, so certainly with um, HTML5 uh, and web-based approaches, the, uh, the onboarding, the, uh, the level of entry into immersive reality is, is, is really now quite low. You don't even need to download apps for a lot of this stuff. Uh, and even the development platforms are web-based. So you don't even need to download software to create immersive reality uh, learning experiences, which which I think is fantastic. All you need is a, a web-based uh, device. And in fact, it could just be your smartphone uh, to be able to create and deliver these types of learning experiences, which for me comes back to that idea of horticulture or student-directed learning, which because that's the devices that they own. And so suddenly they can be creating these interactive learning experiences with the device they have in their pocket, wherever they are. Um, rather than having to come into class and you know sit in the computer lab etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, <clears throat> some of the um, earlier you know 10 year old research by Delgano and Lee um, this is more around computer uh, a based uh, virtual learning environments uh, they called it so it's kind of like flat screen approach to to uh, immersive reality it's uh, slightly unfortunate term because in the UK VLE means what we call LMS um, so uh, in, in the UK a virtual learning environment is blackboard or canvas um, but in this case they're the, the meaning in immersive reality uh, uh, contexts so they've used a, a common term uh, I think in a, in, a, in a different way here so although these are not um, design principles I think they're some of the key affordances or some of the um, key things that immersive reality uh, can achieve. So 
I think these are not, these are really nice five that they've identified. So spatial recognition, um, it's kind of a no-brainer, really. You, you, you're working in this 3D space, and so it's going to help with spatial recognition, uh, spatial knowledge, experimental, uh, experiential learning. Hopefully, that's part of the goal is is uh, being able to learn in effectively virtual environments that are real. Uh, engagement, I mean, it's a bit of a low key approach, but uh, students tend to enjoy immersive reality environments because it's, it's something new. Um, but you want to go beyond engagement, it's a little bit of a low, low hanging fruit as, as far as an achievement goes. Um, but certainly getting students engaged is key. Contextual learning, <clears throat> being able to sort of, I guess, bridge that, that gap between theory and practice. And, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and be able to um, have students collaborate. That's an interesting one because uh, a lot of virtual reality experiences tend to be solo experiences. How can we actually make them collaborative? Um, that's a little bit of a rethink. <clears throat> so some of the design principles that people have identified. I like this uh, um, continuum. This is from one of my colleagues, uh, Claudio Aguayo. Um, looking at the, what is this idea of a continuum between the real environment and the virtual environment, and going back to this idea of learning environment risk and how they map to that. So with a real environment, you're uh, <clears throat> learning something which potentially is very high risk. Uh, and uh, certainly, you know, at the end of the day, people need to experience that. They need to learn how to engage with those high risk environments but as a novice learner, you don't want to, you know, um, have them kill themselves or mutilate themselves. <laughs> um, and as we map across this, um, you can see, you know, a virtual environment is a very low risk as far as the, uh, my wife's just giving me a, a glass of water. Thank you, babe. Um, so simulated risk environments, but you can actually map in onto those. And one of the things my PhD student is doing things like how can we actually bring some of these elements of the real world into that virtual environment as well. So uh, in this case, exploring uh, mountain safety um, by doing things like doing the VR experience inside something like Snow Planet. I don't know if you have something like Snow Planet in Australia, but it's like a, a huge big shed down a hill that's you know fully air conditioned and it's like a virtual snow slope. Well, it's a real snow slope. So you're going to pay, instead of going down to the mountain, you go to Snow Planet and then learn how to ski, etc. And it's like a giant fridge, a giant freezer. So his idea would be um, <clears throat> we get stu uh, students uh, to explore this virtual environment that he's taking at various risks, like um, how do you neg negotiate a crevasse or how do you avoid an avalanche uh, in a really, really cold environment so that you start to get some of those factors of of uh, the possibility of feeling really cold, perhaps some of the noise involved, et cetera. And um, you can bring into those other elements. One of the uh, projects that we'll talk about later uh, is using biometrics. In other words, uh, things like um, uh, tracking people's heart rate and blood pressure to see if the virtual environment is actually producing real world stress. Otherwise it's kind of not, not particularly um, you know, real or immersive. I like these uh, three simple design principles from, um, it's pretty hard to say the name, Kartuglu or something, um, who was a PhD student of Tom Reeves. Tom Reeves is kind of the, uh, the guru of design-based research. He's now an emeritus retired professor, but they've come up with three basic, really simple design uh, principles, which I quite like because they are simple. Um, the key one, I think, being you know, you don't have to spend millions of dollars on your immersive reality experience. It just has to, um, you know, well, I guess that's number three as well. Um, you know, the fidelity of the simulated experience doesn't have to be exceptionally high as long as it enables learners to suspend belief and feel like that what they're experiencing is real. Okay, so you don't have to throw millions of dollars at something like a, a cave. Um, Immersive reality cave, you can do it with a headset. As long as it's having the, the appropriate effect on the learning. 
Um, and then perhaps rather than having to completely rep reproduce a, a, a learning experience, um, replicate where you can. And if you can't replicate it exactly, then innovate and think of how you can make the learning experience appropriate. Um, the other thing we were talking before about collaboration. Collaboration is an essential element of authentic learning. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's possibly going to be a new experience for students, particularly online. Uh, and so you need to scaffold that quite carefully. How do you build that into the assessment? How do you build it into the formative approaches? So I've got a list of some examples and uh, we're rapidly running out of time here. So I might leave this most of this for homework for you to have a look at yourselves to click on those and have a look at some of these. Um, <clears throat> You can see a lot of the resources I've got here are in clinical health. It's just some of the context that I've been working in in the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, immersive reality, virtual reality has application on a wide range of, of learning contexts. Uh, so things like uh, art museums, music. Uh, I know a couple of people said they're interested in music. Um, things augmented reality and automation appear virtual field trips, uh, virtual lab experiments, um, you know, particularly in COVID-19 and, and distancing, how can we bring the, the lab home or, go, or beyond the physical lab, um, creating geolocation games, um, some really cool stuff with uh, virtual music production. Um, as long as you may be interested in this, um, I don't know if you've played with Cool Gadget, but it's, excuse me, a, a mobile, app for music creation um, and there's a free version and a paid version. Um, I run it on my iPad, my iPhone, and uh, it's a whole lot cheaper than buying a, a new synthesizer um, <clears throat> as an app on your device. But they're about to release a virtual reality version of that. So it's kind of like this um, virtual world we're using music creation app. And at this point, they haven't actually released it, but this is kind of what it looks like. It's going to look like the interface. Kind of interesting. I'm not sure if it's, it's you know, bordering on the necessary or not. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what the experience is like. So instead of it just being, you know, a flat screen of production, you will turn the volume of that down. You're going to have this more immersive being right inside the music production virtual studio as such. It's interesting. Obviously, I'm interested in music. Uh, and a little bit later, some virtual hands. Thomas, I was going to say, that's an example of cognitive overload theory. <laughs> yeah, I think it could be, uh, uh, Mitch. Anyway, interesting. Um, yeah, a, a few other uh, contexts there and then um, some resources from the University of Melbourne. A lot, there's a lot of people doing a lot of work in this uh, and there's some really good, great resources that you can use. So I've just linked to a few of these. <clears throat> um, ben Loveridge has been involved in doing a lot of workshops. Um, obviously Mitch and, and um, uh, Meredith and her team. Um, Stuart's done a, a lot of presentations on his work as well. So there's a lot of resources uh, that people have done. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So some of these are really good. Well, they're all good. And then I've just got an example um, <clears throat> from uh, one of the projects I've been working on closely over the last few years. And we'll probably talk a bit more about this in the panel tomorrow because Stephen Aiello, who's one of the key researchers, uh, will be joining us for that. What we've been doing in this particular case is um, quite different. We've been linking biometrics into the virtual experiment uh, uh, space to try to bridge, I guess. Um, <clears throat> you know, you ask students after they've had a virtual experiment and so, you know, it was quite fun. We enjoyed it. Um, we learned, you know, we thought it was cool. But was it really, you know, ticking the box of being authentic for them? Um, and one way we're trying to triangulate their subjective feedback, 
because you know often students will tell you what they want you what they think you want to hear is by uh, mapping heart rate and skin conductivity and, and blood pressure and seeing there really were moments of actual stress involved in that virtual experience and mapping it to what those points of uh, stress were. So that's a really interesting project. So enough of me talking, we have gone past our time. Um, tomorrow, we'll have our expert panel and get a whole lot more in vo voices. I'm not gonna be talking much at all tomorrow. I'll probably just introduce the panel and then we'll throw it open to Q and A. So thank you everyone. Is there anything anyone would like to ask or talk about before we finish this session? Oh, Tom, first of all, thank you. This is amazing to have this kind of workshop running. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. So thank you. <laughs> um, that, that final slide that you had with the, um, with the, the, um, the sort of skin conductivity and those, those things. What's, the, what's that, that one? What was that slide that you showed? What was the paper? So that's the MESH 360 project. And um, if I, uh, let's, if you click on the short guide, uh, a link, <clears throat> it will take you to that and it's the last part of it. Brilliant, um, thank you. So it's an example of some longitudinal research in immersive reality. Um, so we did start by partnering with uh, a group of um, biometric researchers in Chile. Um, Claudio, one of our, our researchers, is from Chile, and so we had that partnership there. Um, <clears throat> so they had the expertise, and they were writing their own software and creating their own uh devices for um, you know collecting that data what we did find was that uh, it was a little bit clunky uh, and their prototype devices broke <laughs> uh, and um, so at the end of the day we thought well why don't we just use something that's commercially available like an apple watch and um, use a commercially available app um, <clears throat> in, in between sort of developing our own and so that's, that's where we're at at the moment using an apple watch which end up being a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. So bridging that, I guess that wearable technology to immersive uh, virtual reality as well is, is really interesting, I think. Yeah. It's probably quite interesting in the music domain as well. How do you, how do you merge you know, the physical touch of, of a musical instrument uh, into a virtual domain? And is that yeah. really a worthwhile exercise anyway? Or is it like Mitch said, you know, bordering on cognitive overload and, and creating this huge extra barrier. Well, yeah, experience. but it, it's what I find really interesting is that it's almost one of those questions of, of what takes pre, so there will be, there will be things like cognitive overload, there will be things, you know, that, that, that are, uh, if you like, are, are bringing the scale down, but then what are the, the, um, the things that you're gaining so yeah what are the benefits and is it worth that extra yeah, learning yeah yeah, yeah yeah and and we find that what's really interesting about technology in general is that it's leveling the playing field so music classical music used to be quite a highbrow thing that you know to, to go to a conservatoire uh you you were usually of a high ses you were white upper class you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and now because of technology we're getting a lot more students coming in that have never I mean, they, they, they've, learned, they've learned guitar on YouTube. They've never had yeah, formal yeah. lessons, you know. And, and so there's this interesting interplay. And what COVID shown us, of course, from a playing together um, perspective, uh, is that people are now are realizing that they can perform with people from around the world, from you know all different backgrounds. However, there are limitations. Like you know, that's what Ben's working on is, is you know. Um, networked music performance versus VR and and again what are the affordances what are the the complications but it's also yeah. something where our audiences of the future are going to be more and more online well we're seeing that at the moment uh, which is a very good thing because again it's opening up the audience to music in a way that you know they don't have to go to a concert hall and pay money to see um, but yes how do you interact with an audience that you can't see yeah, and, and what are the, the learning outcomes for your students? Um, so my, my first teaching role was teaching audio engineering and music production, um, <clears throat> which was technology-based, but it was very focused 
And uh, the key there was there's only a certain number of jobs for those graduates. So, you know, for me, it was ethically responsible to broaden their experience beyond that one um, very defined niche exactly. so that they had wider opportunities for employment later. And I think that's similar to, you know, obviously music um, <clears throat> as well. And, and, and as you said, in today's context, yep. you've got this potential for an international audience now, as long as you've got the technical skills to be able to do that. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah yep. interesting. Hey, thank you, everyone. I won't take up any more of your time. So we're going to meet tomorrow and we're going to hear from uh, Mitch and Stuart and Meredith and, and, uh, and a few, few other people, which I'm looking forward to. So thank you. See thank you. you. Thanks, Tom.